All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us uh, for this webinar. Uh, I'm Fan Dai, the director of California China Climate Institute, and I'm glad to be here with you today to discuss the US and China's carbon neutral goals and their implication for long term decarbonization planning. Um, just before we started, a few very quick house housekeeping notes. Um, today's discussion will last about an hour and 30 minutes. And if you would like to direct any questions during the discussion to any of our speakers, please enter them in the Q&A area on your screen at any time during the webinar, and we'll do our best to answer them live. The dialogue is also being recorded and will be available on the Institute's website um, after a couple of days. So now I'd like to introduce our distinguished discussants. Chris Bush, uh, Chris Bush is Energy Innovations Research Director. Well, he leads the firm's California Climate Policy Program and provides evidence-based reasons for optimism in the battle against climate change. Um, an expert in carbon pricing policy, Chris analyzes California climate policy and the courses of states succeed in decarbonization and ways to replicate these insights in other jurisdictions. Hu Ming is the executive president of Beijing Institute of Finance and Sustainability. Um, hu Ming has over 20 years of experience in energy and sustainable development policy, which includes 12 years serving as the program director for low carbon economic growth program of Energy Foundation China. Huming has published articles and co-edited books on low carbon cities and environmental governance and often speaks at leading climate energy forums. Welcome, Huming. Um, and then Hal Harvey is a uh, friend to our institute, who is the CEO of Energy Innovation, a San Francisco-based energy and environmental policy firm. Since its inception in 2012, Energy Innovation has delivered high quality research and analysis to policymakers around the world and across a range of jurisdictions to help inform their policymaking decisions. Um, previously, Hal served in leadership roles at several predominant environmental philanthropics. Um, the paper that we're going to discuss today is one of the recent products um, by this team. So I guess, um, Chris, we'll start with you um, about the presentation of China's 14th five-year plan on energy. And you can tell us a bit more about your uh, working paper on China's carbon neutral opportunity. Chris, over to you. Thanks so much, Fan, and uh, thanks for the invitation to talk with you and, and for organizing this. And thanks to all the staff at the Institute as well for your work building the Institute, which is, I think, going to be a really important link between China and California and the US. Um, I want to thank my co authors too for, for their help and, and uh, collaboration on this paper. Um, I'm going to leave it to Hal Harvey, uh, CEO of, of, of my firm, our firm, Energy Innovation, to tell you a little bit more about it, Energy Innovation, um, a little bit more about myself. I'm a alumni of, of the University of California, Berkeley. I actually graduated and studied in the same department that Max Offhammer teaches in now. Uh, I might disclose that in 2002, Max and I co-managed the Second World uh, Congress of Environmental Economists in, in Monterey. So, um, and also I, now I know what it takes to get them to provide comments on one of my papers. So that's great. Uh, joking aside, um, I'm gonna give you a summary of the paper that uh, Humin, Majun and Hal and I released earlier in the year. And um, it's fun to have uh, some news to share on a positive uplifting topic. Um, I'd say in summary, what we show is that several mega trends are coming together to change the economics of climate policy and creating new incentives for ambitious action. Uh, and, and even though solving climate change is a moral imperative, if self-interest can help all the better. Um, and in, our, in this presentation, which I'm gonna start running now, uh, in this presentation, 
um, what we're going to see is that renewable energy has emerged as the least cost source in uh, countries all over the world. And uh, they've come to dominate in international markets in terms of investment and, 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 and uh, megawatts or gigawatts built. And electric vehicles are, are also growing strongly and appear on the verge of, of disrupting, if you will, transportation. The idea of a race to the top is not new, but it's never seemed cl so close to becoming re a reality. And if national self-interest motivates climate action, reaching global consensus can thankfully recede as a hurdle to real climate action. So moving on to an overview of what we'll be talking about, I'd like to cover three major points to uh, support the point, this uh, larger thesis that uh, there are growing economic advantages for China with uh, stronger uh, decarbonization policies. First, we'll talk about learning curves. Uh, they relate greater deployment of a technology and better performance and to, to better performance and lower cost. They capture how greater uh, deployment leads to learning by doing and economies of scale, uh, predictably boosting innovation. We'll see how learning curves are working in our favor and making a transformation to clean energy increasingly affordable. The second topic, uh, we'll look at uh, specifically the power sector and how the plunging cost of renewables is creating an opportunity for China to push deeper with its climate policies, with its decarbonization effort, while also saving money compared to current, uh, the current tra trajectory for the sector. And last, the last major topic, well, the next major topic is uh, global markets and investment trends in clean energy and technology, uh, which present important growing opportunities for China. Uh, and accelerating the pace of decarbonization in China would surely boost the competitiveness of Chinese companies in these large and growing markets. You know, I said three major topics earlier. Uh, we will briefly delve into a fourth, and that is uh, the, some of the challenges. Uh, it's important to be realistic about uh, the hurdles we have to overcome. And, and so we'll touch on those and also look at some next, next steps for uh, overcoming uh, these remaining challenges beyond some of the affordability hurdles we're seeing crossed. Okay, moving on. Talking about uh, learning curves here, this shows this this graphic here shows learning curves for some key electricity generating technologies. Along the vertical axis, we have uh, levelized cost of electricity from new plants, and along uh, the horizontal, we see uh, cumulative installed capacity, uh, a proxy for how emerging or established technology is, in the sense that it shows uh, the, the more Install, installed capacity there is, the, the more experience there is overall. Uh, levelized cost of electricity is simply a way to compare uh, what it costs to construct, maintain, and operate a, a new plant. Um, what we see looking at some of the specific trends are uh, the cost of coal remaining roughly level over the last de decade and safety concerns driving uh, nuclear plant costs somewhat higher, while renewable energy costs have dropped sharply. Uh, to understand why renewables are so susceptible or amenable to learning curves, uh, see that the cost of fossil fuels and nuclear are highly dependent on the price of fuel they burn and a power plant's uh, operating costs. Renewable energy plants are different. Their operating costs are low and they don't have to pay for fuel. What's determining the cost of renewable power itself is the cost of the power plant, the cost of technology. That's why learning curves are especially pronounced uh, for renewables as we're seeing here for wind and solar. Next, we're looking at some specific data from China. This is levelized cost curves for wind and solar over the last decade. Again, using China specific data, these are the, the line bolded in the middle shows the average weighted cost. Uh, the le left panel looks at solar specifically and shows it's fallen in cost 86% with the innovations over the last decade. And on, on the right, we see uh, wind falling 39% over the last decade. Impressive reductions, but just the beginning, those learning curves are gonna continue driving the price of building these 
types of uh, technologies down in coming years. And we'll look at that specifically in a, in a little, in a minute. So moving on to what the learning curves mean, uh, specifically for China and power sector uh, transformation and climate policy. Um, this um, next graph shows uh, levelized costs again for new plants. It adds uh, coal, uh, coal costs, um, which are been around $50, but increase uh, in, in the future under this uh, as graphed to somewhat higher, expecting that coal plants will face shortened running hours in coming years. Uh, even the lower bound though shows coal basically staying level and not re reducing in cost. Um, what you'll see then is also that, uh, uh, what I'm gonna do is actually zoom in to show more closely the crossover point when uh, solar and wind in the last couple of years dropped below on a new plant, uh, generic new plant cost basis, coal. And you can see here uh, that that happened in, in uh, 2018 and 2019 for, um, uh, or I should say 2019 and 2020 for, for wind and solar respectively. Um, this crossover is on the one hand exciting, but maybe not a surprise as there have been several assessments recently that have found uh, uh, these types of uh, gains. And um, they're actually interesting uh, studies showing about half of existing coal plants are running at a net loss considering just the cost for operating them, the fuel and, and other operating and maintenance costs. Um, Rock, a recent Rocky Mountain Institute study found about uh, half currently, and the, you know, replacing those with new plants would yield monetary savings of $18 billion, they estimated, and, and further found that by 2025, they're expecting uh, around 95% of, of China's coal plants to be uncompetitive in the red and, and failing to cover running costs alone. And, and that's what these graphs in this next slide are, are showing. Um, these are comparing just the ex existing uh, operating costs of fossil uh, coal and, and, and uh, CCGT here stands for combined cycle gas turbine, uh, natural gas, a new natural gas plant in other words. So, sorry, not new. These are existing fossil plants. This is new renewables versus existing fossil plants and, and showing that in many cases, uh, Really, what these graphs show is we're close to parity between uh, onshore wind in the wind case is the, is the, the example that's close to parity. Offshore wind is, is still uh, coming down the curve, but is very promising. Uh, onshore wind and, and, and utility scale PV are uh, close to parity on average with coal um, currently. So um, that's an exciting, another exciting threshold. Uh, along the transition to, you know, uh, really accelerating the transition. Um, still, uh, what we've looked at before is these levelized cost comparisons are a, a plant level metric. And what we do in this next slide is move to a system level analysis and grid managers will emphasize the importance of system reliability and the need to worry about uh, having uh, proper uh, backups, if you will, for uh, any variable sources on the, on the grid. Uh, and so what this, but, but even considering those types of resource adequacy investments uh, at a system level, there are still cost savings from uh, advancing ambition in the power sector. And that's what this slide shows graphing several different um, scenarios from a recent paper that's listed in detail at the bottom. And what the red line shows is the, the reference system as it's labeled. And that's uh, the reference, uh, reference scenario uh, similar to the 14 five-year plan and also the existing uh, 2030 commitments by, by China, uh, roughly level emissions in the sector. And, um, then in the blue, we see uh, emissions falling 34% uh, below that reference in 2030. Uh, and rapid cost reductions mean those, uh, that those reductions 
can actually lead to costs of 11% below uh, the reference case. Uh, deeper reductions of 50% in 2030 compared to the reference would deliver reductions of about 6% compared to the reference case, according to this paper by Hogang et al. So that's uh, the domestic opportunity. And, and so now we've, uh, in terms of focusing on the specific savings available in, in the power sector. Um, next, wanted to highlight uh, another, uh, the last major area of opportunity, uh, international competitiveness. And um, what we're gonna see uh, is that uh, China's domestic advances position them well to uh, benefit from growing demand for clean energy and clean tech products in international markets. Uh, China has already established strong positions in solar, wind, advanced batteries, and, and these have a strong potential for uh, growth and to become new pillars of its economy as, as actually several of China's own strategic documents around uh, economic development point out. Um, turning to this graph in particular, what it shows is uh, growing uh, a, a sum of different types of energy transition investment as, as put together by Bloomberg New Energy Fa Finance. And what I think uh, so mostly in the power sector and renewable energy and in, in shown in yellow in green an interesting segment there is the growing amounts going for uh, EVs and and transportation electrification in general. Uh, and also the fact that there was strong growth in 2020 while most economic measures headed south uh, due to the pandemic last year at a global level. Um, these are large and growing markets. Uh, looking out to 2030, the World Bank's International Finance Corporation estimates the value of clean energy and technology markets will add up to $23 trillion. Um, so bolstering domestic climate action would deliver uh, you know, benefits in this regard in, in terms of success in these markets. Turning uh, to a specific case, this case of solar energy and as background, I just wanted to briefly mention the, the idea from the economic literature, literature called the home market effect, whereby larger sales of a given product at home drive larger sales of that same product abro abroad, which can be traced back to the 1961, as a matter of fact. And um, we're gonna look a bit at solar as a, as a case study of how that can work. Uh, Domestic innovation and manufacturing capacity, in effect, can contribute to export success. Uh, and, and you'd expect to see that under the home, home market uh, effect hypothesis. And so you'd expect to see that given what we're seeing in solar, given what we're seeing here. Uh, and these are annual installations of solar uh, with China in, in red and clearly the largest uh, domestic market for solar installation of, of any country. Uh, and we see what you'd expect exactly with from the home market effect uh, in this next slide uh, with Chinese firms supplying over 70% of the world's PV panels and a growing share of, of poly silicon and, and cell inputs. Turning to EVs, these are almost, uh, meaning electric vehicles, these are almost universally expected to supplant internal combustion engine vehicles in the coming decades as the technology of choice for transportation. And these, this, these expectations are being driven by uh, innovation in battery electric storage. And another example of learning curves shown here where these are battery pack prices for EVs declining 89% over the last decade with the average price for a kilowatt hour uh, on the vertical axis, and then again, years on the, on the horizontal. And because batteries are the main, have been the main difference in the past for the main differential for making electric vehicles more expensive, this is a really significant trend. And um, in the next couple of years, uh, EVs are expected to drop below gas or other fossil vehicles and 
purchase price and they're already more efficient and offer savings on fuel and in some cases total savings when all maintenance and fuel and purchase costs are taken into account. So this is an amazing, another amazing learning curve story, right? And uh, we're going to see how it's playing out then in uh, China, China's uh, what went more in, in the in the world trends for EV sales. Uh, the left panel showing annual sales of EVs, uh, and again China topping uh, comparisons across countries with uh, topping a million. Uh, units EVs sold in 2018, although the, in 2020, the U European Union took the top spot uh, with EV sales uh, of around 10%. Um, in the middle panel, we see cumulative EV sales. Uh, they'll reach 10 million units this year and even and show that China is still has a cumulative deployment advantage despite the EV, e EU surge last year uh, in, in uh, surge last year. So finally, at right, the, uh, we see a panel tr tracking EVs as a percentage of global car sales from uh, uh, the last decade, again, reaching 4.4% uh, most recently in 2020, a strong 84% jump from the 2.5% in 2019. So is there a home market effect at play here for China as well? Indeed, there seems to be. These are uh, data on share of global production capacity, showing strong positions for China in batteries and electric vehicles. 70% of uh, global production capacity in battery cells, battery cathodes, and refined lith uh, lithium. Uh, it seems pretty clear China's positioning itself well to lead on, on EVs and, and more broadly on clean technology. Moving towards wrapping up, uh, it, these are some very promising trends, but it's you know, important to be realistic. And if the world were perfect, we'd all have Teslas now. Um, there are formidable challenges, absolutely manageable. Uh, and in fact, some are as much about reality. Uh, some are as much about perception as reality. So I'm, I'm uh, uh, not playing fair a little bit in in including a good news story on the challenges slide. And and what this slide shows is Germany's experience tripling renewables on their grid while improving reliability. Uh, and specifically, the, the graph shows Germany increased its share of grid delivered electricity. Renewables, renewables and grid electricity to 42% while it reduced consumer outages by nearly half from 22 minutes per year to uh, 12 in uh, 2019. So this to us suggests uh, power reliability fears are very manageable and um, uh, there would have to be a lot of in installation before you start reaching uh, problematic tipping points. There are challenges, absolutely. Uh, the complexity of, 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 of a modern grid is, 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 is higher for grid managers. Uh, simple system inertia is another one. The complexity of managing fast large scale change at a, uh, unprecedented rates in energy and infrastructure and the associated social complications especially for people and communities invested in fossil energy. Energy, Still with 2.2 million solar jobs already in China, we are happy to conclude on a point of optimism that even these type of just transition challenges may be manageable. Uh, and so with that, I'm going to stop the presentation and uh, turn over the, uh, the mic, if you will, to my co-authors, uh, Human and Hal, and, and looking forward to the discussion to come. Thanks, Chris.
Huming, um, do you have anything you anything you want to add to the paper? And especially, thank you, Huming, for joining us from the Europe. Um, I think my I actually had some questions uh, while listening to Chris, but I'm going to save those questions to later as we go into the discussion. So I'll turn it over to Huming, um, and then how Harvey uh, see if they have anything to add on the on the presentation. Thank you, Fan. Uh, thank you for inviting me to join this exciting uh, panel. And uh, we are very happy to launch this report. And uh, Chris has done a great job introducing the main uh, content. Uh, I would just add a, a couple of points about how this report were uh, received in China and how we have been communicating the content uh, in China. I think uh, uh, first, I would like to. Uh, uh, introduce that we this report 90% of the work actually has uh, was done uh, already last summer. Uh, so that was the time we start to communicate with the Chinese audience, many of the uh, policy advisors, the experts that we know very well in China, who are advising on the economy policy progress in China. Even though the paper by that time was uh, written in English, uh, but the content uh, when we communicate with the Chinese audience, it was quite well uh, received and uh, informed the ongoing policy um, discussion at that time. Um, I wouldn't claim any credits, but uh, I myself believe that some of the evidences clearly showed in this report have uh, informed the uh, discussion leading up to China's uh, carbon neutrality pledge, because the fact was very clear. Uh, it's very feasible and it's a win-win solution to China. And I think uh, secondly, um, the uh, when the report was uh, formally launched early this year uh, before China's MPC session, uh, there are a lot of um, ex uh, readers reaching out to us about uh, the content of uh, this report and I think that it helped to really build the narrative about China's green growth uh, story and also um, helped to explain to the world that why uh, China is so committed to do this and why it is very feasible um, economically and in many other ways and it's really not only a political pledge, but it is really it makes a lot of sense to China's uh, quality growth uh, future to many other social and economic goals. Uh, I heard people say it's, uh, I forgot the name, but um, I, I, there was a journalist from Financial Times. Uh, he was, I, I told him, Do you, if you wanna reach out to Chris, I can introduce to you, but he said he made a, Chinese name. So he talked with me about this paper. He said this was the first time um, he had ever seen such clearly and very comprehensive description about uh, uh, what's happening in China. And uh, it's so convincing to him to see that uh, in China's carbon neutrality goal is not only a like a sudden decision, it makes a lot of sense in long term. Uh, so I think uh, uh, if you also the Chinese version we have launched will be very helpful uh, to inform the domestic discussion, especially at the subnational level, uh, where a lot of decision making need to happen this year. And also there are still some um, debates around whether this is a short term uh, uh, you know, feasibility in many uh, specific regions where the economic is still relying on energy intensive industries. So I think it's, um, uh, we are very happy and I'm honored to be part of the co uh, authorship. And also I wanna pass the apologies that Dr. Majin cannot join today's panel, but he um, has been uh, promoting this paper in China very well, thank you. Thank you so much, Booming, and congrats again on the launch of this paper. And I'm also very glad to hear that 
the the story of it being uh, shared before China actually made the carbon neutrality pledge last summer. And I think you were being very modest of not taking credit, but I think it definitely um, has helped uh, quite a bit to uh, China's uh, uh, eventually the carbon neutrality commitment made in September. Um, turning over to Hal, um, Hal, you're uh, pretty familiar with the context and I'm sure um, in the process of writing this paper, you probably have communicated with a lot of Chinese policymakers. Just wanted to see how you have anything uh, to add in terms of the, the paper itself or just in the context of the US-China climate, uh, I should say partnership or engagement or coordination. Um, first of all, let's always hope it's a partnership or coordination or colleagues. Um, thank you, Fan. Uh, it's great to be here. And uh, I'd like to thank Chris and Hu Min as well. Um, the paper is an important benchmark for this conversation. What I would like to do, however, is um, zoom out a little bit and talk about attaining China's five-year plan goals. And it's uh, what might be in this next uh, NDC, the Nationally Determined Contribution that it submits to the Glasgow Treaty process coming up and how this pertains to this. I believe we're at inflection points with uh, the grid, with transportation, with buildings, and we'll soon be in industry. And so what do I mean by inflection points? With the grid, it comes down in many ways to the crossovers that Chris laid out in uh, his graphs. When it's cheaper to build an all new wind farm or solar farm than simply pay the operating costs of an existing coal plant, that's a hell of a crossover. Uh, usually economists compare marginal costs to marginal costs, but here we're comparing all in costs to marginal costs, all in costs of solar or wind to marginal costs of coal. Um, so this argues for runaway growth in renewables. And in fact, it's underway. However, traditional managers of grids wanna tap the brakes pretty quick because they're not used to using power sources that they can't turn on and off. And it takes a excellent Christian to be able to pray for, pray for precisely dispatch sunshine or, or wind. Sorry about my facetiousness there. Um, so side by side with low cost solar and wind, we need new grid management paradigms. And there are fantastic opportunities there to, to go with a, re, a variable uh, renewables intensive grid um, and still make the grid more stable. Chris laid out the meta statistic with the German power uh, uh, blackouts going down by half to 12 minutes per year, even as they increase renewables to 42%. Um, but if one takes a, a fair and square look at all the options, there are many, many. Um, the first is to wheel power over bigger distances. China has made an incredible network of uh, high voltage DC lines um, and is in the process of reforming its utilities into more competitive, uh, smaller pieces. But bluntly speaking, um, the grid companies do not swap power between provinces very well. And so there are times where there are surpluses in one and shortages in another, even though they're connected by copper, which should cover wire, which should smooth it all out. There are also ways to use prices to smooth it out. You can charge more when electricity is uh, thin on the ground and, and sell it cheap when there's surplus electricity. Um, both of those require regulatory reform more than physical changes. But turning to the physical side, we're used to managing the supply side of the energy system, but what about the demand side? What can be done on the demand side? Um, I'm a big fan of heat pumps, which give you four units of heat for every one unit of electricity. They do something else though, which is they let you heat up a water tank, say, when electricity is uh, in surplus and then tap up the heat when you need it later when electricity is short. The cost of thermal storage with a heat pump is the incremental size of the water tank. It's essentially free. Um, thermal storage is dramatically cheaper than electrical storage. And my point is they can be swapped for each other with intelligent demand side choices. Um, there are many other options. As batteries become cheaper, then uh, grid scale storage becomes feasible. Um, and then one can rethink the role of fossil fuels. China is not going to go to 100% renewables immediately. There will be fossil fuels burned. 
But for the interim, let's burn them for shortages, extreme events when it's incredibly cold and there's no wind and keep a city warm for a couple of weeks or three weeks till the winds come back. Let's not use it for bulk power. The environment cares about the integral of power over time, which is to say energy. But the grid cares about the instantaneous uh, supply of, of, elect of electrons. And so if you, if you use, I, I say use gas, for example, for capacity, not for energy, use it for spot, spot choices and you get fantastic grid stability at an incredibly low price. We're focusing on the grid because all of those crossing points that Chris laid out, uh, but keep in mind too that a decarbonized grid is the enabler for decarbonizing the other sectors of the economy. Uh, the electric vehicle strategy we've talked about, um, there are fantastic opportunities. We've just cracked the door open on electric vehicles and they become demand side management tools as well. And let's not forget the huge side benefits of uh, eliminating diesel truck pollution, eliminating carbon monoxide and nitrogen oxide poisons, eliminating particulates. Um, the conventional pollutants in China cities are legion, <laughs> unlovely, and they can be significantly reduced uh, with electrification of vehicles, especially buses, trucks, and urban vehicles. They should be first in line. On the buildings, you heard me talk about heat pumps. Um, uh, they're not quite magic, but they're pretty good, pretty good uh, attempt at it for engineers. Um, and there are other technologies, LEDs, light emitting diodes, 90% reduction in heat. It's time, simply put, to outlaw the manufacture of fluorescent lamps. They have mercury in them, they're inefficient, they're ugly, they blink, let's get rid of them. There's a treaty that regulates mercury called the Minamata Treaty. And it's got a, its, council, its COP meeting is coming up in November. And I think China, which makes 70% of global fluorescent lights, but makes it even more LEDs, should introduce a resolution to ban the further production of fluorescence. The Minamata Treaty regulates mercury, not energy, but you get there anyway. And the side benefit is eliminating a vast amount of mercury poisoning. So there's a lot that can be done on the building side. Finally, I'll turn to industry. Industry is the toughest um, because there's so many sectors. You, we call it industry, but in fact, there's steel and aluminum and pulp and paper and fertilizer and chemicals and so forth. And each of these needs a pathway to zero. Here, what I think needs to happen is for the Chinese government and indeed all modern governments <clears throat> to spend the time to draft a pathway to zero. In fact, we have to do it for each sector, a pathway to zero for the grid, which has to precede or be faster, I should say, not precede, be faster than the others. A pathway to zero for transportation, for buildings, and now for industry. And the pathway for the first three is going to uh, reveal itself because it can be based on existing technologies. But the pathways for industry are going to have to be, they're going to have question marks in them. You know, we can, we can use uh, heat pumps to heat up industrial processes up to a point, but beyond that point, they need an open flame. Can that be done with green hydrogen? What's the cost of green hydrogen? How fast can we make electrolyzers cheaper the way we've made solar PV panels and EVs cheaper? So one of our great challenges is for every sector to draw a pathway to zero. And within that, this biggest sub challenge is to do it with, with industry. All of this argues for two things. First of all, China can and should decarbonize much more quickly. It needs to peak by 2025, not 2030. Um, and, and, and second, uh, we need to be realistic about the transformations here. It's far easier to transform if you start early because every building built that's inefficient, every car built that's run on sun, runs on gasoline, every coal-fired power plant built is a stranded cost. It's a debt we will have to pay financially. Let me wrap up by, by saying that um, uh, I have great respect for Chinese managers, leaders, and scientists. Um, and I'm also acutely aware that the United States has to do everything I've said that China should do and faster and same with Europe and same with India and Australia and Korea and Japan and so on. The top 20 nations in the world have 80% of the carbon and greenhouse gas emissions. They hold the fate of their earth in their hand. So they have a heavy obligation to 
move rapidly and seriously at reforming their energy systems. Um, but as Chris pointed out, there's an economic bonus if you do it. This is not about sacrifice. This is about opportunity. And there are fantastic opportunities for China, for the US and for other countries. In the run up to the Glasgow conference, um, I know Secretary John Kerry is in Shanghai right now meeting with his counterparts from China. Uh, let's hope and let's push that this opportunity becomes reality, that these pathways to zero are the pathways that our, our countries and other countries get on ASAP. So thank you, Fandai. Thank you, Hal. That is the really enlightening uh, um, thoughts and thanks for offering the big picture um, for power sector transportation, building, and uh, also the industry. So that's really comprehensive. Thank you so much for sharing your, your thoughts. Um, and again, how, as you mentioned, while we are talking about this paper here, it's, uh, we couldn't find a better time, right? Mm -hmm. Secretary Kerry is visiting Shanghai at this moment and uh, believe the Secretary Kerry and his counterparts, and they're possibly trying to find a way for the US and China stay coordinated and possibly cooperate for this common yep. threat. So I think it's really, really a good and strong point on that. Um, so this is um, the presentation part. And we are also very grateful to have with us two uh, extraordinary experts who will be offering their commentary um, for this paper, as well as their op uh, observation and opinion on this topic. So have with us, we have Dr. Uh, Max um, Alfhammer, Professor of International Sustainable Development and Associate Dean in the Division of so Social Sciences at UC Berkeley. Max is uh, a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research in the Energy and Environmental Economics Group um, and a lead author for the inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And his research focuses on environmental and resources economics energy economics and applied economics. Um, and also Max, I should point out, Max is uh, one of the co-chairs um, of the Academic Advisory Committee for our Institute. Thanks Max for joining us. Um, and Thank we also you. have Dr. Andrew Su, who is an assistant professor of public policy and environment at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And, and her research explores the intersection of science and policy and the use of data-driven approaches to understand environmental sustainability, particularly in the areas of climate change and energy urbanization and air quality. Andrew is also uh, one of the top experts um, on China climate policy. So glad to have you with us, Andrew. Um, I'll maybe start with uh, Max uh, for him to share his uh, comments for uh, this paper. And Max, I also had uh, two questions I wanted to ask you, but start with your, uh, with your comments first. All right, thank you, Fan. And I'm also in the unfortunate position uh, to speak right between what I consider two of the, the leading experts, and I'm just a fanboy of, of, of both Hal's work and, and, and Angel's uh, work. I you know, always assign her TED Talk uh, when people ask me what they should, what they should watch to get to know this, uh, this field. So I thought, I, I, I really liked this paper. If you're out there looking for some good news, a glass not half full, but three quarters full, you should read this uh, paper. What I really liked about it is it was really comprehensive in uh, across sectors and technologies trying to show us using the most recent data what you know what's on the horizon here. Uh, now that I've listened to to Hal's comments, I sort of wish that there was a, a part two to the paper that sort of summarized what what Hal added in the end there uh, to talk a little bit about the technologies and the uh, sort of market or you know organizational structures. Uh, required to get us uh, to, you know, the sort of higher penetration of these technologies that we're we're looking for. But 
Overall, economists are not known for their cheerleading on sort of renewable technologies. We're usually the Debbie or Donald Downers in this particular uh, landscape. I found the analysis in this paper really solid. It's hard to argue uh, with, with data presented here. And this is consistent with what you see in studies uh, across the world. So overall, I would just say congratulations on a job well done. I enjoyed it. I learned a lot. And I'm going to wait for my question because I know what it is. I have more to say to link up into you know, uh, <laughs> what we're doing. Great, thanks, Max. Actually, speaking about technologies, right, as uh, Chris presented, learning curve, what do you think, in your view, what are the most exciting uh, policy options and technologies uh, that will be critical in the near term in burning the, the curve, as we're talking about the curve, toward uh, decarbonize the future, especially for China? So to me, this is where where markets and technologists have to hold hands, right? Traditionally speaking, the economists have worked in their silo and the engineers have worked in their silo and they don't end up you know, talking uh, uh, together or with each other uh, enough. So I think what we need to really think very carefully about is creating market or regulate, regulatory environments that incentivize the rollout of these new technologies that maybe right now are still really high costs, but 10, 15 years down the road, uh, maybe will not be. Or for the technologies that are a little bit more mature. So think about large scale wind farms and, and, and large scale solar PV rollouts, thinking about designing markets and infrastructure. And by that, I mean institutional infrastructure to make sure that we're using these uh, technologies in the way they were designed to be used and also allowing their efficient uh, upscaling here. What do I mean by that, right? So if we look at the institutional frameworks that we've seen in China uh, in, the, in the not so distant past, there was a tremendous amount of, of curtailment in certain areas of the country simply because of the way that sort of, you know, feed-in tariffs and things like that were designed. So uh, folks that work on the design of energy markets, super nerdy stuff, uh, where we've learned a lot from the German experience, we've learned a lot from the California experience, and helping us think about how we're going to design the dispatch and the sort of implicit incentives in the way we dispatch electricity across such a large economy over a large period of time, I think is really key. I of course acknowledge that it's not something that we're not doing. Lots of people are, are thinking about that, but I do believe that sometimes we, we get a little bit too excited about the technology and how costs are dropping and not really worrying about what the sort of economic ecosystem is that these technologies step out into. In terms of technologies that I get excited about, uh, Hal mentioned it briefly. I do think trucks are the, the, the big thing that we need to worry about, uh, both the sort of intermediate, you know, sort of 150 to 300 mile trucks or the bigger ones. What are the technologies that we're going to use uh, in that context, both here uh, in Europe and, and in China? Uh, there's a lot of money being thrown at sort of battery powered trucks, but I think the sort of hybrid technologies that we're seeing lots of experiments on sort of a hybrid battery uh, combination, thinking about, you know, what do we do with all this excess uh, electricity that we'll have at some parts of the day, what do we do with it? Uh, you know, making hydrogen is one part uh, that one could think about, and maybe that could intersect with, uh, with trucking where just you know, the amount of weight we move compared to a Tesla is just uh, so different. So there's some work that, that I've been doing and others have been doing uh, at Lawrence Berkeley Labs, looking at what the consequences at, at grid scale are for this, but really thinking about what if we shift away freight transport from liquid fossil fuels over to, you know, electrons and maybe molecules of hydrogen at a global scale. I think there's a lot of money to be made, but there's a lot of carbon to be saved at the at the same time. So that to me seems to be the the one 
next step technology that I'm really excited about. Great. It's always amazing to hear from economics about talking about technologies. <laughs> it's always very optimistic. Um, and thank you, Max, for sharing your, your thoughts. Um, so turning over to Angel. Uh, Angel, I know you've uh, done a lot of research actually uh, about the non-state actors role, and you've also done uh, quite some research um, on China's climate policy. Question, um, just curious to know, what is your take in terms of um, the non-state actor um, and subnational action in this equation? And, um, and I know in, uh, you guys have developed some kind of um, indicators in the past to check the um, climate actions. Do you think um, that's something, um, you know, that data driven, we, we could um, expect for some kind of indicators to track China's progress um, and in terms of their implementation of um, their plans and meeting their targets? Wow, that's a really uh, complex question, but thanks so much, Fan and Jennifer, for inviting me here today. And um, I'm in the difficult position of following three great presentations by Chris, Hu Ming, Hal, and Max. And I'm sifting through my notes trying to figure out what else I can say that hasn't already been said because there have been a lot of really robust uh, comments and discussion already made. But I want to first start by just commenting on the really excellent report that the team at Energy Innovation has put together. And um, I was mentioning to Chris before we started the panel that I use the China Energy Policy Modeler tool for my China Energy class. And I always really love it because it's so clear and the data that Chris presented was just so rem reminiscent of what you can get from the tool. So it's such a useful um, uh, piece of software. So thank you for doing that. Um, so what really struck me important was just the overwhelming case for the economics of renewables versus fossil fired power and coal power in China. And so I, I think it was really great that Humi talked about the reception in China and how positive people are there. But I was thinking, have you done the same thing for the US? Because I feel like that's where we really need to be talking about this incredible story and this incredible data, because I don't feel like in the US context, policymakers are necessarily aware of the economics and these incredible numbers. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I was testifying in the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee and the questions I kept getting from a political party, and I won't name names, but they kept um, harping on the fact that fossil fuels are cheaper and isn't it true that Americans want cheap oil and, and cheap gas for their cars and renewables are more expensive. And, um, you know, I just feel like if you presented this, this research and these numbers, they, it was just very clear the case is now uh, no longer economic to continue to build new coal fire power plants or even to continue supporting and maintaining and operating coal fire. So I think that was the part that was really striking for me and how I mentioned these as crossover points. I think that that's a really brilliant way of talking about some of these numbers. And so I just wrote down some of the key figures that stuck out to me talking about if uh, China had been investing in new renewables and backup storage to replace these uncompetitive coal plants, it would have saved an estimated of 18 billion US dollars. And, and also looking forward uh, in, in, in 2025, 94%, so nearly all of these coal plants are gonna be more expensive to run than to actually replace with new renewable power plants and storage. I mean, that to me is just incredible. And so this whole economic rationalization of decarbonization to me is so compelling. And so if there is reticence from governments to take net zero targets or to decarbonize or develop these plans, I just feel like you can't really point to the economics anymore or reason for it to be being too expensive or just not competitive economically. So to me, that was really huge. And, and the number about how uh, electricity sector decarbonization could actually increase China's GDP in 2030 by an estimated 6.9%. So I think that's like the number one point. So they're also doing the outreach to US policymakers and US audiences, because this is so critical in not only the competition and race to the top for race to zero and decarbonization, but also I think for facilitating the US China relationship on climate. So that's one point. And then I was also, but how can these costs and favorable economics really flow outside of China? And I think that's the next question. And I, I am certain that this is gonna come up on the agenda with Kerry and, and Minister Shizunhua, because I think that that's a piece yet that we're not seeing from China. So currently about three quarters of China's overseas investment in the energy sector are still in fossil fuels. 
And so why haven't the economics yet tipped to also benefit primarily developing countries that are that are taking up uh, Chinese loans and Chinese investment in technology in fossil fuel sectors. And so to me, that's that's a piece that I would love to see uh, as a next phase of this report or some discussion around how then we can actually translate and move some of these numbers to, to benefit other countries. I mean, we know in 2020 that all of the, the new power that came online was in renewables. And so that's really encouraging. But then how can we actually make that really stick and, and scale? So that's something. Um, my second point was, was also on grid management. So the report talked about rethinking grid management and how actually pointed to all of my points that I made about technical and institutional flexibility that is needed. And then uh, we've heard a lot about China's plans to build the largest ultra high voltage electric grid in the, in the world, but that has had a lot of starts and stops. And so it's still um, a, a major question as to whether or not that's going to actually help um, solve a lot of the, the grid integration problems that they've been having. Curtailment rates are still really high on average over 30%. In some cases, as high as 40%. And so that's still an issue. Hal mentioned the regional coordination between the electric grids also as a problem. So the problem about dispatch, uh, China has these fair dispatch rules. Uh, and so there has been some experimentation with economic dispatch and even green dispatch. But um, you know, more of that needs to, to really happen on a national scale in order for the type of flexibility that's recommended in the report. So I'd love to see more of those recommendations in the report. And then the last piece that, that I was really um, struck by is also the discussion about the role of policy. And I'm really glad that Hal also brought up a lot of those points because I was really hoping in the report that there would be more specifics, but exactly what Hal mentioned, actually using regulation and strong policy measures, such as getting rid of all fluorescent lights, banning them, for example, through even international conventions like the Minamata uh, Treaty. So that, that to me was something that I was hoping um, some of the authors, maybe Chris and Hal and Huming, you have some other ideas, of what the increasing policy strategy could look like. And also I think to, to Max's point, what could some of the incentives look like and also some of the, the market um, policies that could really help China. We know that China has been experimenting with a uh, emissions trading scheme, which has already gone online. And then uh, they've also been discussing the carbon tax for some time, but are there other policies that could also help to increase the stringency? So um, Fan, if I can actually get to your question, I just really wanted to comment on the excellent report because it is a really tremendous piece of work. Um, in terms of the, the non-state actor piece, I mean, I think that this is, this is really critical. And my research has specifically looked at the additional impact and the additional contribution. And I see uh, one of my former students on the panel who actually contributed to this early work. So hi, Ihao. Uh, it's good to see you here. And so uh, what we've shown in this research is that some national governments, local uh, governments, cities and, and regions can actually lead to an additional one to two gigatons on top of what national governments have pledged in 2030. So helping to close that emissions gap between the current policy trajectory and where we need to go in order to contain global temperature rise between 1.5 degrees Celsius. So, so that's um, something. And what, what we have seen recently um, in the last couple of years is that Chinese companies and some national governments have actually become a lot more active in the space. Whereas I think when I started this work, a lot of people kind of raised their eyebrows and they said, well, why are you looking at this bottom up action in China? It's a vertically integrated governance structure. And so the cities and the companies are just doing what the national government is directing through these uh, five year plans, for example. But actually what we're seeing is that that's not the case. So companies are actually forming their positions on climate change adopting their own net zero targets, for example, and actually going beyond their, their uh, directives. And, and cities are doing that. Shenzhen is a notable example of where they've regularly exceeded their emissions reduction targets, their carbon, in, carbon intensity reduction targets. So I think that that's really quite promising. And um, in particular, during the last four years where there was li relatively little between uh, the national Chinese and U.S. governments on climate change, the subnational piece was still active. So there still was person-to-person -person exchange or institute, I think, really exemplifies the person-to-person scientist-to-scientist exchange that was still happening. There were still cities that were collaborating. Uh, former California Governor Jerry Brown hosted the 2018 Global Climate Action Summit that brought a huge delegation from China to San Francisco. And uh, there were something like 13 MOUs that were signed on many of these uh, pieces that we've been discussing on electric vehicles, for example, ZEVs, emissions trading. So that was also really promising. Um, so I, I guess I'll just leave it there for now because I know that um, there's a lot of other uh, comments and perspectives that can be shared. But thank you again for organizing this really uh, interesting panel. Thanks so much, Angel. That was uh, that was also really, really insightful. 
Um, and I like your point about uh, the contribution or the impact of non-state actors or subnationals' uh, contribution to the to this to this climate uh, action. Actually, it's in in addition to when what nations are already doing. They're not just uh, simply uh, doing what the national government or federal government tells them to do. So that's a really really good point. Um, I think actually, Angel, you actually teed up some very interesting questions that I had. I was going to ask ask the, um, the authors of the paper. So I might just take the privilege here um, and turning it back to Chris, Kuming, and Hal for a couple follow-up questions. And then I think we should get to um, the Q&A that we've got some questions from the audience as well. Um, so I guess the first question for, for Chris and the, the team is um, any, any response that you want to make uh, given Max and Andrew's comments uh, to the paper. And I think I would specifically wanted to hear, looks like the, the math is clear, the path is clear. We know what, you know, it is actually cheaper to um, develop renewable energy and uh, apply that into the grid. We know that the pathway as how kind of eluded um, for different sectors, but are we ready? Are are the policy, the politics ready, or the implementation stage? Are we ready for um, actual implementation of those policies and the concept into a different level? So I wanted to really uh, take this opportunity to ask all three of you in terms of the challenges that you see, uh, especially in China and in, in the implementation of those plans and uh, possibly, uh, you know, somebody can, can uh, talk something about subnational level implementation. Maybe start uh, with Chris again. Sure, thanks so much, Fan, and, and thanks to the discussants. Um, Vis-a-vis -vis Max, I guess I'll just say, I, it seems my shameless flattery of, of the German experience worked, uh, but uh, in all seriousness, it's, uh, I'm, I'm honored by your, your comments, Max, and, and hope you'll uh, continue to, uh, you know, continue the discussion would be great. And Angel, uh, thank you as well. Really insightful comments as well. And um, I would say I agree. I think uh, we could have done more uh, with regard to being specific about policy and, and the like. Um, and, you know, I think I would turn it over to my co-authors, perhaps I'm sure, I think Hal would have some brilliant ideas and, and whom in on, on, you know, what we what should have said on the policy front, for example. I'll just offer a couple of quick thoughts and then we turn to whom in. <clears throat> so it's interesting to contrast the transformation journey that's ahead of us in the US and China. So first thing we have to acknowledge in both economies, there's a lot to be done. You know, we have to rethink, remake, replace the basically the heart of our industrial economy. Now there are many incredible technologies that make it actually cheaper than the old way. So the first problem in both countries is um, doing tomorrow what I did yesterday. It's incumbency. Right, power system designers, power system operators like to turn power plants on and off. That's what they do for a living. And now we're asking them to think about the demand side and storage and batteries and distributed generation and wheeling power and market systems and all this other stuff. Um, so I'd say that the first obstacle is not now price or technology, but institutional um, structures that we're used to playing with. Against that, however, we have the two biggest scaling systems on planet Earth. And one of them is the market. Cheaper things sell more than expensive things if they provide the same amenity. And we're just sniffing at the potential for market transformation here, sector by sector. And the other scaling machine on planet Earth is China, the Chinese party, the Chinese government, the Chinese people, the Chinese economy. There's been more economic transformation in China than in any time in any place in the world until now. If you look at any statistic you care to think about, whether it's cars or buildings or people brought out of poverty uh, or average national income, um, China pegs the needle. So if China squares its shoulder and says, we're going to decarbonize, it will not only happen, but it will spill over into many, many other nations. And the technologies that it drives will spill over into many, many nations. Um, 
And I think the distance between where we are and where and that happening has as much to do with conceptual and habit as it has to do with technology or economics. So we need therefore policy and the policy has to be well-designed and it has to be rapid. And you mentioned subnational actors. There's no question in my mind that as the 14th, the 14th five-year plan is a series of nested plans with the top level plan and then the sector specific plans and then the provincial plans. The provincial plans are where we are going to see magic. And we're going to see it in Hainan and Shanghai and Guangdong and some of the Eastern provinces. I, be, I bet we begin to see it in some of the central provinces as well. And those, if they get out ahead, can bend the curve closer to 2025 rather than 2030. So there's, there are huge opportunities there, but it's, it's gonna take some courage and some drive. Great, thanks, thanks, Hal. Um, Hu Ming, let's go to you um, for some of your insights. Thank you, Fan. Thank you, Hal and Chris. I, I also want to thank the generous uh, comments to this paper, even though I should not take too much credit. Uh, it's all Chris's work and Hal's work. Um, I, so I, I think, first of all, uh, it's, I would like to kind of defend the paper that not talking about policy forward uh, a lot. Uh, I think the, the paper is trying to respond to the fact that there are a lot of evidences ignored um, by uh, many of the, you know, the, by the field and by the policymakers. This is to present the fact uh, it's happening already. Um, but there are, in the past months, I think uh, many of us have seen there are many uh, reports uh, talking about uh, the future uh, scenarios and what's going to happen. And there's even reports talking about the carbonomics, uh, like what carbon neutrality will be helping China. Uh, that already presents some of the policy uh, roadmaps and what technology we need, what policy we need, what kind of goals we need to set. Uh, as Fan um, mentioned, the mass is clear, the path is clear. I think. Uh, all this report just to actually keep directing to the, the, the facts we already know for a long time. So the policy are there, it's nothing, it's, I, I wouldn't say it's nothing new, but it's nothing magic. Uh, like how wrote a book about climate uh, policy and solutions and a lot of evidences are already there for many years. So if we're talking about what China should do, I like uh, the uh, energy policy simulator scenario. We always talk about the best policy scenario. So if China could adopt all the world-class policies in every sectors around the world, uh, that will be uh, extremely helpful. And I think uh, what we have seen, we are seeing this is going to happen some way, like in the EV sector, renewable energy buildings, um, and but after all, it's a transition uh, progress. It's not going to happen overnight. I think it could, could not be happen overnight. Like it's not going to be today. We announced the 2060 goal, and tomorrow there is no coal burning anymore. Uh, we probably need to be a little bit patient to see this transition happen as short as possible. Uh, and this is why this provincial um, plans, as Hal mentioned, and the sectoral plans will be very uh, important. Many experts have mentioned the, uh, the subnational actions. I think also, this is also nothing new. If we recall five years ago, over five years ago, when we have this US-China climate summit in LA, there is a Alliance on early picking cities uh, established. There, Beijing announced that they are going to pick up by 2020. Many other cities talking about 2022, 2025. Um, it was basically inspired by that and uh, this early picking uh, momentum. It's, it's it has been built up, and now many cities and provinces are going to do that. I think. Uh, it's very clear if the subnational government will not to establish ambitious targets for absolute carbon caps and early picking and carbon neutrality goals, China as a whole will be able to uh, achieving this uh, uh, climate goals. I think it depends on local government to really do their job better 
than the overall uh, average level of the uh, of Chinese uh, regions. Uh, I think uh, right now is uh, the provincial government are in the process of developing the plan uh, required by the Ministry of Environment, required by NDRC. Um, and I also, we are happy to see a third of provinces actually are planning to set quantitative early CO2 picking commitment like carbon cap. And half of uh, provinces has commissioned policy research or developed carbon neutrality action plans uh, already toward long-term goal. So uh, all of this work will be the great um, uh, uh, area we could see promising uh, policy progress and also see where maybe US-China can collaborate in future. Uh, my, uh, my team, we had the privilege to be able to work on a plan for Chongqing uh, toward their 2050 goals in the past a couple of years and using actually Energy Innovations EPS tool, we helped to, um, uh, to develop their policy roadmap and also the green finance roadmap. I think this actually leads to the, the market-based tools, how important it will be to help local government to achieve that. Many of the studies has showed that uh, there are like ton, billions, trillions level uh, R&D will be needed to fill the gap of the investment toward clean energy uh, technologies but how to get that investment and uh, how the market policies could be able to leverage these actions. I think that's a very um, uh, pressing uh, question for many regions to answer too. So we uh, are happy to see that in the local government, uh, not only talking about a picking plan, a uh, carbon neutrality plan, but also talking about a, a financing plan to make that happen. And uh, I think in addition to what Angela, a professor who, who mentioned that there are a lot of non-state actions happening in China, the most uh, promising and exciting uh, progress to me is what the financing regulators are doing and the SOEs are taking actions these days. Those are the very important players in China to decarbonize the, the uh, economic uh, structure. Like, for example, the People's Bank of China, which is a central bank, bank has uh, made a carbon neutrality as their priority of the 2021 uh, work agenda. And uh, uh, the, uh, the governor, Yi Gang, who's the, the governor, Yi Gang, the central bank, he said uh, green finance is one of his uh, priority and we need to improve the green finance standard system, removing fossil fuel uh, related projects from the green bonds category, adding climate friendly projects, mandatory environment pro uh, information disclosure, integrating climate change into the risk management uh, system of the financial system. And uh, at the local level, also, uh, China has six uh, provinces and nine cities. There are green finance pilots, including Shenzhen, that uh, is one of our favorite places. So all of this are going to uh, contribute to um, really move the financing, including uh, uh, the overseas finance, to the right direction. And uh, on the SOE side, um, many of China's state-owned enterprises, they are energy giants, like uh, China National Energy, the largest coal producer, and Baowu Iron and Steel, they are like the number one producer of iron steel in, of, of the world. So many of them are also committing to pick their uh, emission uh, earlier than 2025, and some of them already developing their carbon neutrality pathway. Uh, I, I think to myself, this is uh, the most exciting progress um, uh, leveraged by uh, the, the carbon neutrality pledge. I wouldn't go uh, all the details and there's a list of actions that is going to help China achieve the goal. But I think overall we have seen um, very promising progress, but uh, we also need to be a little bit patient to 
see the transition really happen in uh, the coming years. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hu Ming. Although I would love to see the list of actions that you have at some point uh, uh, and how those would help China um, in this transition. Uh, one point about green finance, Angel, you also mentioned in your comments that um, one of your observation is in, in, the, in the financing uh, perspective that China, although being made a lot of progress, but uh, three quarter of its investment also still goes to fossil fuel overseas. I wonder, Angel, if you have any um, any any comments on, on, on this, uh, given what Hu Ming mentioned, the progress being made and the commitments being made at the uh, different financial institution and SOEs in China. Um, any any uh, comments that you might have to that point? Yeah, thank you, Fen. And I think that that is so encouraging. So Hu Ming, thanks for sharing that because um, there has been, I think, a lot more international pressure, particularly on from NGOs on China to basically green its entire investment portfolio, particularly through large uh, development banks and also through the Belt and Road Initiative. And um, I think at a November of 2020 investment forum with Europe, uh, Minister Xi Zhenghua, he said that China can't continue to support these fossil fuel projects overseas because it's fundamentally incompatible with China's uh, net zero and carbon neutrality goals. And so it's really encouraging. I, I was hoping that in the 14th five-year plan, we would hear some more details as to exactly what that would mean, whether it's a ban on projects or phasing out or reduction of support. Um, and so, and I think there's still a lot of um, uh, work to be done to clarifying exactly what green finance is and, and, and what it, it means uh, concretely. And so I think that's really promising that China's moving in, in that right direction. And I mean, I think it speaks to also the challenge of carbon neutrality as a goal and what that means. Um, if, if China is cleaning up its emissions at home, but then still leaking and supporting a lot of these projects overseas, does that is that in line with the carbon neutrality target? And so some of the research that my group has done has been digging into how different actors, whether they be companies or national governments or city level governments, for example, what do they actually mean by net zero? Because there's not a consistent and single definition of what that means. And many people interpret it to mean zero emissions, but all it really practically means is that the emissions that you're putting out are balanced by removals. And um, so I think I think that's a, that's a real question for China that China's going to have to confront if it actually is going to be credible in its carbon neutrality target. I mean, I will say in this, um, Professor Professor Zhang wasn't able to, to join us because, you know, he's been part of the team at Tsinghua developing these roadmaps for how China is going to get to carbon neutrality. And so I was actually digging into some of his presentations and analysis in preparation for this panel. And one of the things that really struck me in their analysis is the fact that not uh, necessarily relying on unproven or unscaled technology such as carbon capture and sequestration, direct air capture, for, for instance, um, relying on uh, overly relying on uh, land-based removals, for example, in in afforestation or reforestation projects. I mean, they're really focused on clean energy and renewables, and 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 what they're good at, and what they've actually proven that they're able to to do and really succeed and shatter virtually every target that they set for themselves. So, to me, that gives some more confidence in in net zero and and China's plans. But yeah, I think this this overseas piece is a really big picture of it. Of, of that, that hopefully we'll be able to get more specifics and get some firm commitments from the Chinese government moving forward. Great, thanks, Angel. Um, great that you you've you've answered my question, but you also just uh, also answered one of the audience question, uh, touching on carbon capture and storage. And I I don't know if any uh, of other speakers have anything to add to that question about carbon capture and storage. But in light of the time, we have about 10 minutes left. I like to uh, quickly go through some of the Q&A here and I would love to leave a couple minutes for uh, some final words, um, especially wanted to hear from how um, some, of your, uh, some of your thoughts about the US-China collaboration. So going to the questions quickly, um, I think the first one asking, can we share contact info of the speaker for further discussion? Uh, Chris, I'll defer that to you if it's uh, something we could help facilitate. Uh, I guess, yeah, maybe just by private, can you exchange things privately? That would be happy to have a private conversation with someone. 
Okay, well, we'll take that on and help uh, connect you with uh, this, uh, um, the audience. Second question is asking, um, has there been data from China demonstrating how China's energy industry would manage the climate conditions causing near disaster in the state of Texas in the winter of 2021? You know, there are already many climate extremes in China. There are sandstorms in Beijing, there's flooding in the south. Um, uh, we're entering a world where we need to pay more attention to what you might call fat tail events. Um, it used to be with a normal distribution, you could uh, go two or three standard deviations out and be pretty safe. That's no longer the case. If you look at the distribution of temperatures or rainfall, uh, the distribution is getting wider and flatter. Um, and so what Texas taught us is that governments need to help build buffers into systems. Um, there's other systems that need buffers as well, supply chain buffers, for example. You know, a significant fraction of global auto production is frozen right now because of some chips aren't being made in a factory in Tokyo, or not in Tokyo, Fukushima. Um, so so uh, one needs to breathe life again into the interaction between state actors and private sector actors. Private sector actors as a rule hate buffers, hate surplus, hate storage, hate inventory. Public sectors have responsibility for supporting their citizens even in times of duress and those are increasing. And may I just add to that, uh, historically, energy systems planners have not taken climate change into account when planning for capacity uh, transmission or anything like that. Uh, in California, we started doing that about five years ago or something like that uh, in a state that's, of course, experiencing some of the most drastic consequences, wildfires, for example. So I think, you know, just from a planning point of view, it's not just the institutions and, and, and markets to be developed here, also thinking really carefully that there is a new bad player on the block here, which is climate change that is going to affect infrastructure and uh, demand for, for electricity in really sort of pointed ways. Thanks, Helen and Max. Um, another question from David Uli asking if Trans-Pacific shipping could be an area of cooperation between the US and China. It's a great idea. <laughs> we need to invent zero carbon ships. Um, uh, I've suggested that, you know, there's very few ports on the West Coast. If you go all the way from Mexico up to British Columbia, there's four or five really big ports. Um, they should just stop accepting dirty ships phase it in, give priority to ones with, uh, you know, start out with low sulfur, move to electric for the last 12 miles, last 200 miles, and then finally go all hydrogen, but set a schedule. And uh, you could do the same with uh, Northern Europe and the East Coast. This can be done collaboratively. Um, the biggest shipbuilders are in Asia, the biggest uh, shippers are Asian, the biggest recipients are Europe and, and China, uh, sorry, Europe and the US. So interesting opportunities. Great, thanks, Hal. <laughs> um, two more questions. One is, uh, I think, Angel, this might be a question for you. It's a follow-up uh, to your point um, about the subnational discussion uh, over financing the transition, how things are shaking up in places with less financial worth just, and are there any plans at the central level to address the regional capacity um, I guess Andrew or Hu Ming might be able to address this, this one. I'll defer to Hu Ming about the financing piece because I think she's the, the expert there. Not really. Uh, thank you, Fan. Uh, the, the, I, I wasn't able to listen, hear the question clearly. The regional capacity of what of the financing? Uh, this question is asking how things are shaking up in places with basically less financial capacities and are there any plans at the central level, the national level to address the regional capacity issue? Sure, uh, I think it's a, uh, speaking of capacity is not only the financing but also overall capacity, I think in terms of uh, uh, developing picking plans. Uh, there is uh, uh, 
actions, I mean, efforts going on led by the MEE to provide technical support to local government to develop their picking plan. Uh, they have developed the guidelines and there are also uh, some experts group to help, uh, but still that's not enough. Uh, we have seen huge gap on that front. Uh, in terms of financing capacity, that's a great question because we have seen uh, the mismatch of the financing, uh, you know, the, from the finance world, lack of understanding of what carbon neutrality is, what's the right project to invest, and also what project will be the, the project that they could really generate carbon savings rather than, you know, just green, green uh, painting projects. Uh, that is um, a huge gap. Uh, I think their capacity building of all the financial institutions are uh, needed. Um, but in order to, to improve the capacity, I think from the central government, the standardization, the process, standardization, the due diligence process of the institution, financial institutions, uh, a lot of uh, standard development uh, need to happen and also a lot of uh, efforts in terms of measuring and evaluating the project's climate and uh, emission impact will be very critical, I think. So uh, what I'm trying to say is I think firstly the central um, financial regulators need to really develop a, a package of policies and guidelines to uh, for the financial government, and, and secondly, the lot of capacity uh, building efforts are will be extremely helpful in the regions that there are lack of uh, financial access. Somehow, uh, the uh, the the big banks and the the uh, I mean the central you know the many banks there are uh, headquarters in in Beijing, and they have uh, many branches. Uh, they do need to uh, receive help from the bigger uh, financial institutions. That's what we have seen uh, recently, uh, that many of the green finance department of uh, many financial institutions, including the banks, are quite busy going to different regions to help. I hope this answered the question. I'm sure. Thanks, Hu Ming. And I, I was going to say, given China is also the, uh, the co-chair for G20 uh, Green Finance uh, Initiative, so I will expect to see more measures being taken at the national and subnational level. Uh, last question is from Nanjo. Um, she's asking, there is the concern that 14th five-year plan and proposed NDC is not ambitious enough for China. Um, and what is your thoughts and suggestion? I think this is a wonderful question uh, to take as a, a question for all the panelists and speakers to wrap up our uh, wonderful discussion today. So maybe um, I'd like to go to Hal first um, and, and Hu Ming and, um, and Chris and then Angel and, and Max. I'll go quickly. Um, the, 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 14th five-year plan at the top level doesn't have enough ambition. It just doesn't. Um, for the, to stabilize uh, reasonably and rapidly, China needs to peak much closer to 2025 rather than 2030. Now that's possible the way it's formulated because it's before 2030. Um, the other thing that has to be dealt with is China's building a lot of coal-fired power plants, more than the rest of the world put together. And that's kind of a step backwards. Um, uh, that said, I think there are fantastic opportunities right in front of us. I think uh, the Chinese government is interested in expanding its renewables goal from 20, from, um, uh, I can't remember the exact number, but I think you could go to um, 1700 or even 2000 gigawatts instead of the 1200 that's being proposed right now of renewable energy, clean energy. Um, and that takes care of coal right like that, or not all, all existing coal, but certainly all new coal. Uh, there's huge opportunities for commitments at the provincial level on green vehicles, electric vehicles, um, buildings, and industry. So I would say the top level one is uh, has good indication, and the rhetoric around it is very strong. And President Xi Jinping's uh, uh, speeches have been very strong. But the provinces and the sectors have a lot of work to do, and they have huge opportunities ahead of them. Great opportunities. Great, thanks, Hal. Wu Ming, any uh, final words for? 
the yes, uh, I think Nan asked a question that herself could actually answer. Uh, but this is a great question because that's the concern uh, from the field. But I would always say uh, the ambition level of China's climate action should not be uh, judged or evaluated by the year of picking or by the number uh, at the, the high level. China's ambition should be evaluated by the sectoral goals and the subnational goals uh, this, that we are going to see this year. And uh, actually, many sectoral goals we already uh, seen, like including the EV goals, like by 2035, uh, over 50% of new cars should be EV. And like in the renewable energy uh, world, they are. I, they or can already tell us the ambition level. And also uh, China has a history of overperform, especially the renewable energy target. And the target is set by, by President, committed by President Xi last year in September. It's uh, basically a consensus uh, in China that that goal will be overperformed, um, seriously. So I think, um, we need to see when all the sectoral targets are out uh, later this year, probably in the next uh, couple of months. And I can use your model to see. Uh, I, I, I pretty much, I'm very confident that um, with all the sectoral goals, uh, we will see quite a ambitious, ambitious roadmap of China. Thanks, Gumi. Maybe we should convene another panel when we, after we see those subnational and sectorial targets. <laughs> um, Chris, what do you have to say? Oh, thanks. I, I completely agree. And the one point I was going to add is that building any new coal plants would be a mistake. And to paraphrase Energy Foundation China President Zoji, it would be like drinking poison to quench one's thirst. Great, nice, short and strong. <laughs> okay, Angel. Yeah, I mean, um, Zoe is, is so much more eloquent than uh, anything that I could say at this point, but I, I think what's really critical is certainly seeing what that 2030 uh, roadmap that we're all waiting for, for China to peak emissions, um, because we know that the content of that is going to have to be more ambitious considering now with the 2060 carbon neutrality goal is gonna require uh, amped up ambition, particularly for the renewables. So uh, shifting from, as uh, Hal mentioned, 20% goal to 25%, for example, um, I don't think that China is gonna shift their peaking um, year uh, target before 2030, even though we know they could easily achieve that by 2025. And some scenarios say it can be as early as 2023. But as Hu Ming said, China loves to uh, under promise but over deliver. And so I don't think we'll see anything on that. But with so many cities that have already achieved their peak emissions or through their plans that they're supposed to be releasing in April. Um, so very actually this, this month is April, I forgot what month it is because of COVID and loss of time. But um, we, so we should be seeing that the details of those and then adding all that up, I think we're definitely gonna see more ambition, ambition than what was laid out in the 14 five-year plan. So um, yeah, a lot of people I think were really disappointed by the 14 five-year plan and it not reflecting the new ambition of the carbon neutrality goal. But these five-year plans take years to negotiate and, and, to, and to put into place. And so it wasn't surprising. And I think we will be seeing more details and more ambition because China simply has to. Okay, thank you so much. Great, thank you, Angel. Uh, Max? Just quickly, I hope that the US and China together will join the leadership portion of the global you know, agents for the, the, the climate solution here and treat this as a separate issue to their you know, trade negotiations and all these other things where things aren't so pleasant. So. Keeping my fingers crossed, but uh, that's what I'm hoping for. Other than that, I'm going to let everybody else go to dinner and not talk anymore. Thank you so much for having me. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, all of you. Uh, it's It's been a pleasure and a wonderful discussion. And congratulations again to you all for the paper. Um, and uh, I'm, we're just 
so lucky to have the opportunity to feature your work and have this wonderful discussion about the 14th five-year plan and implications and sharing your insights. Uh, I'd like just to thank you all again for joining us uh, this evening, morning, uh, wherever you are. We hope you enjoy the event and uh, we'll have additional events coming up on this topic. So stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to Hu Ming for staying up late. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thanks so much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.